From politics to prayer, we sit down with some big newsmakers to explore it all. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Faith Nation. I'm Jenna Browder. America is not as divided as the media would have us think. That's the message behind Republican Senator Tim Scott's book, America, A Redemption Story. White House correspondent Abigail Robertson sat down with Senator Scott to discuss how his personal story and others like it demonstrate great hope for unity in America. Senator Tim Scott has a lifelong dream for a more united America than we've ever seen. Despite current political tensions, Scott remains fervently optimistic that dream will come true in his lifetime. Unity really is the future for this nation. Scott writes about how we can achieve this dream in his new memoir, America, A Redemption Story. The story of redemption is the story of my life, and frankly, I think it's the story of our country. And so the more we focus on what we have in common, the better off we are. But also, the more we recognize that typically pain comes before uh, opportunity and that failure precedes success, the more we are to understand the journey that we're likely to experience and that will confront us in the future. As the first African-American elected to both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, Scott credits prayer to leading him where he is today. I find myself living off of the prayer fumes of my grandmother and the, the prayer seeds of my mom. So I am so thankful that I come from a family that understands the power of prayer. As an elected official, how have you leaned on your faith um, while, while serving in Congress? One of the most important lessons I learned is a new level, new devil. It's a, such a truth that you're going to be confronted with situations that are beyond your ability to process everything. But with prayer, you find this calm, consistent presence that the Lord is with you. In his book, Scott describes how he leaned on that presence during the events of January 6, 2021. Uh, the, the fear that you could lose your life in the capital of the United States of America was real. With rioters within earshot, Scott rolled up his sleeves and prepared for a fight. Finding an escape route and finding ourselves in a big room with all the senators together and listening to the bickering and the yelling. And something just hit me. It's like the Holy Spirit really, I really kind of spoke to my heart that we needed a chaplain to pray for us. Scott called the room to order and asked Senate Chaplain Barry Black to pray. As he prayed, you could literally feel the temperature in the room coming down. You could hear the chaos finding order, and you could hear conviction rising in our hearts to go out and finish the day. Scott tells CBN News he couldn't be more proud of how the nation's leaders came together to finish their work that day. He points to Chaplain Black's weekly bipartisan Senate prayer breakfast and Bible study as a source of life for him on Capitol Hill. Republicans and Democrats coming together on a Wednesday morning at about 8, 8.30 to share how faith is intersecting with our lives and impacting who we are. The South Carolina Republican believes America is not as divided as the media portrays. Consistently, I think media tells a side of the story and never the whole story. And so that's a problem. Media has figured out that you can monetize conflict. That's bad for the American soul. In his memoir, Scott acknowledges racism is sadly still a reality in America. You know, one of the things I try to say on a consistent basis is to remind our country we are not a racist country. It doesn't mean that we don't struggle with the issue of race. Still, he sees a path toward meaningful change. The first step towards meaningful change is to recognize the progress we have made. The last 50 years, if you look at the state of South Carolina where I'm from, the evolution of the Southern heart is palpable. Scott points to his winning a congressional seat where the Civil War started, defeating the son of Strom Thurmond, who held the office 48 years and opposed both the 1957 and 1964 Civil Rights Act. Literally, to see the evolution of the Southern heart is to understand that I'm here today because they, all of the constituents in the 1st Congressional District, 
gave me a chance and judged me by the content of my character and not by the color of my skin. If we would tell the story of progress in America, I think we would be hopeful. Now, I know you're not going to make any announcement about yes. 2024, but I will ask you this. Is there anything that might lead you to run in 2024? It's a great question. I would say that it would, it would, it would require the Lord to speak to me in a, in, a, in a obvious way for me to make that decision. The thing I've learned in life is the best way to get your next job is to do the best you can in your current job. When asked how he remains hopeful for our country, Scott replied he believes Ephesians 3.20, that God is able to do exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. She was the South Carolina governor and the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. So what job still eludes Nikki Haley? That story when Faith Nation returns. Margaret Thatcher once famously said, if you want something done, ask a woman. That quote is the inspiration behind the latest book by former South Carolina governor and U.N. ambassador Nikki Haley. Wendy Griffith recently spoke with Haley at her home in South Carolina to discuss her future plan, which could include a run for the White House. Throughout her life, Nikki Haley was told she was too brown, too young, too conservative, and too female. But instead of backing down, Nikki took it as a challenge to do something and be something great. We caught up with Haley near her home on South Carolina's Kiowa Island to talk about politics and her new book, If You Want Something Done, Ask a Woman. It features 10 extraordinary women who, like Haley, overcame incredible obstacles to achieve their dreams. Women like Israel's first prime minister, Golda Meir, to the Iron Lady herself, Margaret Thatcher. She was a grocer's daughter, and she was one that really believed in herself. That's the lesson for Margaret Thatcher. She loved Great Britain, but she really believed in herself. And she came along when it didn't make sense. She didn't look the part. She didn't act the part. She was made fun of a lot. But what she saw was the devastation of socialism at the time. And so when she became prime minister, she really wanted to change all of that. She wanted people to have economic freedom. She wanted them to have the opportunities to be whoever they wanted to be. Like Thatcher, Haley could relate to being an outsider. As part of the only Indian family in Bamberg, South Carolina, a small rural town, she learned a valuable lesson from her parents early on. I remember when I would come home from school after being teased on the playground and my mom would say, your job is not to show them how you're different. Your job is to show them how you're similar. And it's amazing how that lesson on the playground played out throughout my life. You know, whether it was in the corporate world, whether it was as governor or whether it was as ambassador. In 2004, Haley won a state house seat against a popular incumbent. And in 2011, became South Carolina's first female governor and the country's first minority female governor. During her second term, she saw her faith tested when a white gunman walked into a predominantly black church in Charleston and murdered nine innocent people. And at that point, I had hit rock bottom. I was so sad. I was so upset. I was trying to protect a state. I wanted everything to be okay. And I remember one day saying, you know, God, I'm broken. I can't do this unless you help me. And he was there. And I look at even in my most challenging, darkest moments, you know, of any time in my life, that's when your faith grows. I always go back to Joshua, you know, 1, 9, be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged because God will be with you every step of the way. Then in 2016, President Trump asked Haley to be the ambassador to the United Nations. She agreed with conditions. And I said, well, I'm not going to be a wallflower or a talking head. I need to be able to say what I think. And he said, Nikki, that's exactly why I want you to do this. And he was true to his word from the first day to the last day. Haley took part in the historic vote to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Israel's capital of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem has always been the capital of Israel. So it was recognizing a truth. And I remember we were sitting in the National Security Council with President Trump. And everybody was telling him why he shouldn't do it. 
everybody was telling him that war would break out. Everybody was telling him all the negative things that happened. And there were only three of us that day that stood up and said, you need to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. When the president finally made that courageous step, for me to cast, you know, one of the first American vetoes in years, when the world tried to condemn us for acknowledging a truth, it was a moment of pride for me. After serving as governor here in South Carolina and later as U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley says there's still one more job she'd like to have, and it's not vice president. I don't play for second. I've never played for second. So if, you know, if I end up running for president, it's to finish the deal. It's to go ahead and, and do it and, and to lead in a way that makes America proud, to lead humbly, to lead with strength, to lead with conviction, and to lead in a way that knowing that when America is strong, the world is more safe. In the meantime, she's hitting the campaign trail for fellow Republicans while also running in a different way for herself, something she didn't think she could do. I just decided, well, you know, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try and see if I can run. And I think that running teaches you to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So I ran a half marathon in December, and now running has become such an outlet for me. Because when you run, you know, in the mornings, you get your life together, you prioritize, you, you know, you pray, you... You think about all the things that are really important. When asked about running for president, if former President Trump is in the race, she told me. I think right now, America needs someone who's strong, someone who's going to be courageous, someone who's not going to back down from a fight, someone who's got the energy and the stamina to see this through, and someone that knows this is going to hurt before it gets better. And, you know, we deserve that. Our kids and our grandkids deserve that. And it's time. And, you know, um, sometimes it takes a woman. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Kiowa Island, South Carolina. Foreign policy at the forefront. We talk with Senator Tom Cotton right after this. Welcome back. After serving in Operation Iraqi Freedom and nine years on Capitol Hill, Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton has a unique perspective on U.S. foreign policy. The former Army Ranger leans on that experience in his new book, Only the Strong, Reversing the Left's Plot to Sabotage American Power. In an interview with CBN's Matt Galka, Senator Cotton cites what he sees as U.S. failures and points a finger of blame. How America handles threats and relations with other countries seems to stay under the political microscope. From war raging between Russia and Ukraine to ongoing issues at our southern border, Senator Cotton offers his analysis on past mistakes and potential solutions on U.S. foreign policy. There's a lot of history in this book, going back 100 years, the progressive era and Woodrow Wilson coming forward to the presidencies of Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Um, so reading uh, more deeply about the history uh, of the progressive left and their views on American power and also how we've turned it around at various times, whether it was Eisenhower taking over in the middle of the Korean War, Nixon the Vietnam War, Reagan when Jimmy Carter uh, had brought American power to a previous low, uh, wasn't just interesting in itself, but, but also helps a lot in my day job. Cotton tackles a number of topics, including the United States chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. I think it's a combination of President Biden's insecurity uh, and his rank incompetence that led to the collapse of Afghanistan in August before we even got all of our uh, people out. So what should have happened? Um, certainly the president should have not have taken the precipitous steps that he did that ensured failure. For instance, closing down Bagram Air Base before we had all of our personnel out. The senator ties that moment from August of 2021 to one of today's most pressing international issues. Russia's war with Ukraine. Cotton writes, Biden didn't just leave our people behind during his retreat from Afghanistan. His weakness enticed Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine. But Joe Biden didn't invade Ukraine. Vladimir, Vladimir Putin did. So is it fair to completely blame our president for what's going on uh, right now between those two countries? Well, I don't completely blame President Biden. Obviously, Vladimir Putin bears the brunt of the blame for the war of aggression in Ukraine. But it's equally clear that deterrence failed. I mean, Vladimir Putin has now invaded Ukraine twice under two Democratic presidents. He didn't invade during a Republican president. Cotton argues the Democrats are participating in what he calls decline by design. 
Are you insinuating that Democrats, progressives want a weekend country? I mean, think about the, you know, your colleagues, the Democratic colleagues that you've worked with before. Do you think they want a weekend country? It's the, the genuine belief that American power is not likely to lead to strength, safety, and prosperity, but rather to war and oppression and arrogance, that the world would be a better place if America would simply pull in its horns and atone for its sins and become a more normal nation. That's what I mean when I say it's declined by design and the intentional sabotage of American power. Not that progressives aren't, again, necessarily anti-American, though plenty are, but they have deep ambivalence about America and American power and its role in the world. Cotton maintains the United States should continue to provide military aid to Ukraine. He sees it as a major deterrent to one of America's biggest threats. China. Strength and resolution with clarity uh, about our intentions will lead to peace. It won't lead to war. Closer to home, Cotton advocates for a complete overhaul of the U.S. southern border. Apprehensions hit a record 2.4 million in the past year, and the Title 42 policy allowing the government to quickly expel migrants under COVID rules could end soon. The overhaul starts with America's asylum policy. We want to offer refugee and asylum status to people with legitimate fears. You know, if they fear that they're going to be persecuted because of their Christian faith, or if they fear that they're going to be persecuted because they're a woman in their home country. Those are legitimate asylum and refugee claims. But coming here because you simply want a better job and a better life, that's not, for, uh, that's not suitable for our refugee and asylum system. Those kinds of people should be coming through regular immigration systems for people who want to immigrate here and become citizens and become part of this country. Only the Strong could serve as a potential pre-presidential run memoir, although 2024 is not something the Arkansas Republican can commit to right now. Don't have any big announcements about 2024. We've closed the chapter on that uh, uh, so far. Maybe not closing the book for the future, but you know we have young boys, uh, seven and five years old, and that's just a particularly challenging age for dad to be on the road, you know, six or seven days a week for two years. Although Senator Cotton told me he enjoyed being out on the trail campaigning for midterm candidates around the country, it wasn't his full-time job. He added that if his children were a bit younger or older, his 2024 decision could have been different. Matt Gelka, CBN News. Well, the world's best-selling book, The Bible, has spawned volumes of other works whose themes range from theology to personal finance. Another topic, families. That is the subject of a book called The Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak, written by Fox News anchor Shannon Breen. I sat down with her to talk to her and talk to her about her own mother's faith that sets the standard for why she is who she is today. There are certainly truths all throughout the book that I think will be encouraging to people. The Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak follows up on the success of her last book, The Women of the Bible Speak, a number one New York Times bestseller. So talk a little bit about that and, and then also what led you to write this new book. You know, I think that there was a real hunger and thirst, especially during the pandemic, which is when the first book was written in the real early days when there was so much we didn't know. People felt isolated, they were fearful, many of them were out of their churches and kind of at home. And I think it was one of those books that it was just full of encouragement and inspiration. And that's this one too. If you think about finances and family and infertility and all of these different things that women faced, um, they just really translated. So we knew there were still a lot of strong female stories in the Bible that hadn't been told or needed to be elaborated on. So we said, all right, let's plunge into these mother-daughter relationships. One not so easy task, choosing who to include. I think sometimes there are easy, obvious ones like Mary, the mother of Jesus and in the Old Testament telling of Esther. I think that there are some characters that just jump out at you that have had um, really big impact. Their stories have been known over time, even for people who don't really know the Bible, they have some interest or some knowledge of their stories. And then others, I think, I try, I try to choose ones that really resonate with me. Some of these are really small stories where we don't even have the name of the woman involved, but maybe there was a miracle or we really saw God's work in their lives when they were desperate and needed him to show up. Among her favorites. You know, I, I have a little place in my heart for all of them. I think they're all special and beautiful. I love the initial story that we have of Jochebed and Miriam, who are the mother of Moses and the sister of Moses, because we have not just one, but two strong, brave women in this story 
And I love how we see them work together as mother and daughter too. Moses and Miriam, both critical in the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt to the Promised Land, none of which would have been possible without Jochebed's bravery to float her son down the river. One theme throughout the book is the intimate connection between faith and family. And so many of these stories, too, are people who may not be related by blood, but they become chosen or found family, which I think is all of us coming into the body of Christ, being adopted in. And I love the picture of that. Think Naomi and Ruth, the mother and daughter-in-law duo. As Shannon points to her own mother as inspiration. I was really blessed to grow up with a mom who was a bit of a baby Christian um, when I was little, too, and we almost kind of grew together in that she is the best example I know in my life of somebody who's truly Christ-like. I mean, hands and feet, showing up, not just saying, I'll pray for you and forgetting about it five minutes later. I mean, she's on her knees before the sun comes up, praying for people. If you're on her list, it's actually happening. She's the first one to show up when you have a tragedy, if you need a casserole, if you've had a baby, if you're in the hospital. I mean, my mom is the very living embodiment of what we should be, I think, as Christians, respecting other people, whether we agree or disagree with them politically or any other way. I mean, seeing them as God's creation and somebody who is worthy of his, his love and his mercy, the grace he's extended to us, and then we then, um, you know, model that and give that to other people in our lives. So I've always had a really strong example in my mom, and I'm always telling her, when I grow up one day, I want to be more like you. Um, really, she's reflecting Christ, um, but I'd love to be more like her as well. If there's one message she hopes readers take away from this book. I hope it's encouragement. I really hope that will draw them to God to see that he is for you in your family squabbles, in your high moments, in your low moments, um, when you've made bad decisions or good decisions. I mean, he is always present in your life. We see that in these women thousands of years ago, and we know it's true today that we can see the evidence of that. So know that um, he came to save, not to condemn, but to give you his overwhelming love, his salvation. And he's just waiting for you to come to him. And the book also includes study questions for each chapter, making it a great study of sorts to do with loved ones or friends. And you can buy Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak wherever your books are sold. And that's going to do it for us for Faith Nation. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.